Welcome to episode 202 of the Necronomic.com. If you're thinking of starting your own podcast, you should check out the show notes from this episode. You can get up to two months of free hosting from Libsyn. You'll have access to critical stats, helping you launch your podcast, grow your audience, and bring your podcast to life. Go check out the show notes for the Libsyn promo code and start podcasting today. I am James Sabata, horror author, screenwriter, co-host of the podcast you're listening to right now, and Popeyes refuses to sponsor us, so today we're eating people instead. And I'm Don Guillory, author, historian, educator, co-host of the podcast that you're listening to, and uh, I gotta be honest with you, Um, I don't think telling somebody to eat you is, is gonna be a taken the right way after watching this movie. Like I, I can't tell somebody to eat me anymore. Do you think this was based on Jesus? <laughs> oh, anyway. All right. So <laughs> our guest today, Josh Ickes is back. Josh, thank you for coming back again. Welcome back. Thank you for having me, fellas. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a weird obsession with bringing you this time of year. I've noticed that I'm always like, Oh, I'm going to oh, Imaginarium. Yeah. I should talk to Josh. And then I'm like, you should do the show. And you always seem to end up right around now. I mean, you had the October episode as well, I guess. But yeah, there's something magical about this time of year. I love it. Uh, you know, there's a little bit of blood in the air. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> or I was hungry and I've invited you here for nefarious purposes. Oh, okay. So first off, uh, why don't you tell our listeners a bit about yourself, and then uh, you can just just tell us why you picked this film, because I'm fascinated to know what it was about this one. Uh, so, uh, as James said, I'm Josh Higgis. I co-host a podcast called Nashville CA, where we do uh, double features every two weeks, approximately. We've been on a hiatus recently for some traveling. Um but that's a fun show. I also co-host a show called Stagecoach Justice, where we talk about westerns, uh, and we kind of do different seasons. So you'll get like a good overview of maybe a particular actor, director pairing, or or a subgenre within the western genre larger. Uh, so that's a really fun show to do as well. Uh, and other than that, I make movies. I'm professionally a video editor. Uh, my hobby is making movies. So that's that's me. That's me in a nutshell. Uh, this movie specifically was, uh, which is bones and all. I don't know if we've, we didn't even talk about that. So, uh, I never do. I assume they looked before they started, but you know, (laughs) it's a good point you make. Maybe I'm overestimating everything. Continue. Well, uh, as a listener, I will just drop things in my feed from shows that I like. So there are times when I haven't read and it is just a surprise when you guys start talking. (laughs) It's just like, okay. Uh, We're 202 uh, episodes in. This has never occurred to me. Fantastic. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But this one I had watched at the theater when it first came out and I was really, uh, I was under the weather when I watched it. So it kind of happened in a fever state (laughs) to me. Oh, wow. (laughs) Um, And which the movie super dreamy uh, doesn't really, I thought that I was a little more out of it than I, than I actually was because even on this watching, it comes across as like just these moments and fragments and kind of beautiful imagery here and there. Uh, Yeah. But I picked it because um, I have, uh, I have three daughters. Uh, My two eldest, uh, already one has already moved out. The second one is getting ready to go to college is, or it's very much kind of a, a coming of age moment for me. Uh, mm-hmm. like watching my children and watching my daughters go through this. And my eldest, uh, is also trans, which the, the otherness in this really spoke to me as well. And I kind of wanted to dig into some of those themes mm-hmm. that I didn't really pick up, uh, on the first time. Cause the first time through it was seriously just a, uh, you know, I got the longing and kind of the coming of age bits, but the other pieces, I read so many pieces and had so many talks with friends who got a lot out of it that I wanted to revisit it. Fantastic. I had never even heard of it until you suggested it. 
Awesome. And and I was blown away. It was a little draggy in places for me, mm -hmm. but I think that that feeds into the fever dream thing you were talking about. And uh, there's just parts that like, they just feel so like, like almost too slow. But when you put it in those terms just now, I was thinking about how that really feeds into hunger mm -hmm. and how like, like hunger keeps growing, you know, and uh, and this is very much about when it overtakes or things like that, and so maybe that dragginess feeds that. And and I'm I'm notorious for, I believe every movie should have ten minutes cut out of it, mm -hmm. and I believe like uh, my my attention span just sucks. So anytime <laughs> I'm even slightly, I don't want to say bored, but I'm just like, all right, let's keep going, you know, like. It eats at me. <laughs> it, uh, yeah, it eats at me. We'll say that. That's fine. Uh, but as I've been thinking about the movie versus when I watched it, the draggy parts didn't stay with me. You know, mm -hmm. it's about those major points and it's about Sully and it's about Lee and all these like just different pieces. And also this trip that she would make would have draggy parts. Like Anybody who's ever driven anywhere knows that even... When Don drives me like three hours, I'm sure I bore the hell out of him, you know, so we'd have these draggy <laughs> moments. And, and so maybe symbolically that all plays in better than it plays with my own attention span. Okay. Outside of that, I love the concept. I would actually, I, I know I just said all the draggy stuff, but if you went further and made this a mini series, I think it would hit even harder for me because you could kind of explore these things more. Oh, I can totally see that. So what about you, Don? I know this was your first viewing as well. Was it? This this was my first viewing of it um, earlier today when when um, I had time to, to actually sit down and watch it with no distractions. And that was it, the, the stuff we're going to talk about in, 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 in more depth is uh, you guys have already mentioned with respect to identity and belonging and things like that. Um, but it it really drives home this this idea of being alone and that need for human connection, whether we're talking about Sully and, and whatever oddness that he has or the two guys that are camping uh, that, you know, watching a horror film or watching a film, especially the, the lighting that they give and the perspective that they give. You're expecting the worst to, to come from these guys and nothing happens. Um, because it was the same thing. They were genuinely looking for more people like them. Um, because it, it, it comes down to understanding. Like if I have this lived experience and I'm talking to somebody who has not had that, a similar lived experience, there's not much that we can talk about without me becoming vulnerable. And it, it's, it's great to see how this is represented in kind of this abstract identity, um, well, I shouldn't say abstract because cannibals exist, but this this identity, at least in the film, that just seems so out of the norm as far as talking about creating a community based off of eaters, uh, as opposed to something that's based off of gender, gender identity, sexuality, race, nationality, anything like that. It's people of different backgrounds, different walks that have this condition. And the relief comes in finding other people with that condition. So you don't feel like there's something wrong with you or there's something weird about you. It's just that now you actually find something. And, and the the one line that I wrote down, well, one of many lines, one line that I wrote down that I wanted to pay attention to throughout the rest of the movie, because um, I just had a feeling about it. You know, I went in completely blind into this. And that line was uh, delivered by one of her friends at school about sneaking out and said, oh, well, you want to make more friends. Mm -hmm. And from the very beginning, you're thinking that, oh, this is going to be this. I mean, it is a self-discovery, but you're thinking that it's going to be one type of self-discovery. And it completely flips within that first five minutes where you're like, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> Cause I'm thinking like, it's going to be her discovering her sexuality or trying, you know, she, she and the other girl are attracted to each other. And, and now it's our families are keeping us apart. Uh, and then maybe one of us starts killing because we've been kept. And then like, Nope, Nope, that's not the movie I'm getting. Nope. <laughs> 
different type of identity and 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 uh, uh, sense of understanding who you are with this film. Yeah, just slightly slightly different than you thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Josh. Well, let's let you lead the way, man. Hit your hit your stuff. Bring it. Um, God. So, <laughs> dude, this from the jump, right? Um, I remember most movies. If you're talking about the time you're going to cut out, it is somewhere in the first half hour or so for me. Okay, uh, that's a lot okay. of. Yeah, there's a lot of like setup that you don't need in movies. Like you you understand you're watching a movie and a plot is going to happen. So they could jump to <laughs> a plot happening and you would just accept it. Uh, mm. And in this, like it is not long in, until she bites that, <laughs> that other girl uh, and takes her finger, almost takes her finger clean off. Um, and you're kind of off to the races and... I really like how quickly things sort of spin out of control and right. put her in this situation where uh, she's forced to grow up. She's forced to confront um, her, her, I guess, burgeoning adulthood. Um, Cause I think when you first see her, like she's a little bit um, coded as a, as a little kid, a little bit more right? Like wearing pajamas and like, needing her father's approval and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. um, and is immediately kind of uh, tossed out there. And I think that's one of the, obviously it's one of the major themes this coming of age and finding yourself and finding your, your found family or your community as whatever it is that you need. Um, so I think that's kind of the first thing I want to want to touch on was that how that plays through the rest of the movie. Mm. Oh man. Uh, you know, you talk about her biting the other girl. And that wasn't even the kicker for me. And I read spoilers. We all know me. Uh -huh, but uh -huh. I, I knew that she bit her, but I didn't know where. So when it happened, I was still like, oh, shit, you know. But uh, <laughs> it for me, it was the, what have you done? You got three minutes to grab whatever you can get. Mm -hmm, when right. her dad has not just a plan, he has a locked down, practiced plan. And I was like, oh, shit, here we go. You know, like that was the big moment for me. Um, did you guys find the, that moment, the, the slumber party moment, um, it's coded almost like sexually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The, Absolutely. Okay. And like that equation of eating with, uh, or consuming being part of, uh, either like sexual attraction or actual sexual Congress. Um, and you would expect that, like, that would be kind of a very. I think normal, the, the metaphor is drawn very, very directly here for what we're, oh, yeah. what we could talk about with it. Absolutely. And, and I also like, there's nothing in me that thinks she went there to eat a person, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. like, and, and even all the talk of, oh, you want friends or you want that. She's not overly interacting with the others. She's overly interacting with one person and whether mm -hmm. that's sexually, whether that's a person who actually shows her some type of affection, whatever you want to call that. I, I, I really absolutely feel that she went there for a completely different emotional reason. And, and I took it as that emotion pushed her too far and she couldn't control herself. Okay. Um, it's interesting for me to look at this, also, uh, in the, at least with Suspiria, because that's the one I've seen a couple times. I don't know if, have you guys, uh, seen Suspiria, the Guagadinos? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, yeah. and which also has a lot of, um, sort of coded female attraction, uh, and those elements and also the body horror elements occurring <laughs> simultaneously as well. Uh, and it seems, I don't know if there's anything larger that um, Luca is is saying with, with these things. Um, you know, is there like, if you uh, examined the oeuvre, would there be something, uh, you know, a defining statement? Or is it, as in this movie, I feel like just opening up the questions? I like that. I think it's a little yeah. bit of both. Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, I don't know. I find it really interesting. And I... Personally, I have a hard time drawing conclusions um, about somebody's master statement. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, like what is it that they're, they're trying to get across to me because I don't like to play that game necessarily. I like to do the, this is what I saw in it. And I think that that's um, perfectly valid and anybody can do that one. But the, when you get to look at somebody's uh, their over arc of their career and see these themes pop up again and again, and it's like, obviously um, I mean, you know, with uh, Call Me By Your Name and then Suspiria and this, there are these themes of, like, um, identity, uh, especially, like, uh, sexual proclivities uh, and desires that are being touched on throughout all of these um, and that go beyond just uh, uh, basic attractions, right? Right. Um, It is... uh, these are getting into fetishistic <laughs> elements, almost Cronenbergian elements with a lot of this stuff. Uh, and I don't think it's being played just for shock value. I think that there is like a thoughtful and emotional reasoning behind a lot of this. And especially in this movie. Yeah. I, uh, I didn't even realize that the same person made all this. So I've never thought about this, mm. but as you're saying it, like I see so many similarities between those three and that is fascinating. Going back to what you were saying about uh, this is what I see versus this is the overall statement. I I think that's always been one of my big things with this show is it's uh, everything, everything that we consume. (laughs) I did it again. Uh, (laughs) It's just going to become a game now. I'm sorry. Uh, But like every, every piece of media that we consume, we, we look at based on our experiences and our core beliefs and our, whatever else. And so I don't, I've never really liked like, this is what he's trying to say, unless, you know, he's come out and said those exact things. So right. I, I really like how you just summed that up that anybody can do the, this is what I see. And, and that's such a more simple way of saying it than I normally try to explain it to people. So thank you for that. <laughs> but also just, I, I just wish that more people would get that that's okay. I feel like I've encountered so many people that are like, oh, I can't say what that that author was trying to say, or I can't say what that movie was supposed to be about. And it's like, you don't have to. Just how did it affect you? What did you see? What did it make you think? What did it, you know, what did it trigger for your other thoughts and how you're relating it to the world? I think that's beautiful. And that's where I think it's super valuable, like to know the context of the person who you're speaking to um, who's presenting these ideas, right? Like for me, it is specifically, uh, this time in my life where my daughters are, um, and specifically their identities as well. Like Mm -hmm. all that comes into play into my reading and both the intellectual and emotional, uh, impact that this movie would have on me, uh, you know, apart from just like, Okay, it's um, set in the '80s, and it's kind of gory once in a while. <laughs> once in a while, you know, there's, mm-hmm. uh, it, and it's always interesting for me to see, like, uh, because there are things that uh, I was speaking with somebody else earlier um, about another uh, podcast that I've guested on, um, and they do a, a ratings when you're done. Um, and you know, there's a there's a spreadsheet and all kinds of good stuff with it. Uh, oh my! It's, and it's a different um, kind of realm you're playing in. Uh, but another co-host and I, like, go or guest and I, went wildly differently on the movie Whiplash because of the emotional impact that it has on me. I rate that movie very highly. Um, I identify with a lot of the abuse themes that happen in that, the uh, the, the mental abuse right. uh, that happens in that movie. Um, and I think that once we kind of both got out our, not prejudices, but you know where we're coming from with it um, and our backgrounds that might affect it, like I really valued his take then even though we're drastically different. Um, and I think that something like this movie where it is kind of this, this fever dream of um, incidents that happen uh, and you're really left as it's like a, a Terrence Malick film. Like you're left to, for a lot of the structure of it is up to us. It's a, the movie itself is showing us these beautiful little snippets um, and the plot kind of is almost 
background. Uh, and I think something like this is, what does it say to you? What does it mean to you? Um, and especially, once again, context-wise, I grew up in the Midwest, right? Like, Mm -hmm. This movie is all over the Rust Belt and uh, the Midwest. And I think that that also plays into why I personally would respond to it a lot more. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm, I'm just processing all this because it, it, <laughs> even, the, you know, because it, when you talk about lived experience and your bias is going to help you um, look at a film a certain way. And it's definitely it, and, and that's why even I've had this conversation with James before. I'm past saying whether a movie was good or bad. Mm -hmm. Like if somebody asked me if something was good, I will tell them what I liked about it and what I didn't like about it, but I will not tell them, Oh, this movie was horrible because there's a reason why cult movies exist. Mm -hmm. Somebody oh, yeah. likes them just because you may not like it. Doesn't mean that it's a bad movie. Uh, just because a lot of people love it. Doesn't mean that it's good. And I, I remember, I can't remember what I was watching, but they were making, it's probably Family Guy or something that was satirical. And it was making fun of La La Land. And they had this moment that, and somebody didn't know what La La Land It's like, oh yeah, it was that movie that was really exciting that one year, but nobody seems to remember watching. And <laughs> and it was kind of that, that, that same thing of like, there were all these people, this movie is so great. It's awesome. It's outstanding. It's this, 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 this. My wife watched it and she's like, this was the most boring movie I've ever watched in my life. Oh. And for, I mean, for her, because she's not, you know, she doesn't really care for musicals. She did not like it. She doesn't, I don't think she likes the, the two actors that were, that were headlining it either, but it was just her impression of it was, I don't understand what all the rage is with this movie. I don't understand the excitement of it. And that was a good enough review for me it, to, to go in with the whole good versus bad, because something that you may love, something that you may absolutely like die on a hill over somebody else might not like. So You're when it telling comes me that there are people that don't like Anna and the apocalypse, this blows my mind. <laughs> well, I gonna, don't want to know if those people exist even. No, I'm not, I'm good. I'm going to, I'm going to stay quiet right now. Uh, I, so I anyway. know it's That's why I said it. <laughs> I never said I disliked that movie. I never said that. I don't know I if just, anyone loves it as much as me, though. No, no one loves it as much as you. <laughs> You're just upset because it didn't make the cutoff for my top 10 Christmas movies. That's what it's really about. <laughs> but, Continue. I couldn't resist. That, I'm sorry. But that's the way I look at this movie, right? I look for something I can connect with. And when you talked about growing up in the Midwest and, and seeing those things there, you know, that that didn't necessarily resonate with me, but what resonated with me was the idea of you need to leave, you need to move because I, I grew up as a military brat. So mm -hmm. when it came time to make friends, you knew all your friends were, I, I don't want to say disposable, but you weren't going to have any friendships that were lifelong, mm -hmm. right? Because you were going to be either here for six months, maybe three years. At least that was the way it was, was when my parents were in. You were going to be in this one place for six months. You might be this this other place for a year to three years. Uh, there was one time I had to stay with my dad after my well after my parents got divorced when I was in middle school. I had to stay with my dad because my mom was on a on a on a TDY assignment, which is just temporary duty, on a TDY assignment for like two and a half months. And I couldn't go with her. My brother couldn't go with her, so we went to go live with our dad for a couple of months. And if I can't tell you how long those two months were, but those two months were longer than any six month or three month assignment my mom ever had. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it was a very, it was a coming of age time. Now I'm, I'm saying all that to get into this line that, that got, uh, that I learned probably like 10 or 15 years ago about just about writing and about films, uh, especially when the, when the subjects are young adults, whether we're talking about adolescent young adults or we're talking about young adults, 18 to 20, you got to kill the parents, got to kill the other adults because for a story like this, it can't be about the parents and they do a great job of, of still involving the dad, but removing the father completely as far mm -hmm. as Marin's father, right? Uh, Lee's parents. I don't think you never see his mom, right? You only see a sister. Yes. But her, the mother is referenced. So you never get to see these people that would sit there and tell you, hey, I know what you're going through. Even if they don't know, 
I know what you're going through. Here's how you can deal with it. Here's how I dealt with it when I was a kid. For Marin, like the only person that she would know of gets introduced to her by her father, which is her mother saying, oh, yeah, your mother dealt with this. And, you know, she went away. And the idea of I should be able to talk to my mom, I should she should be able to help me figure this stuff out. And then when she has that contact with her mother, eventually, there is no resolution. There is no resolution that, oh, honey, everything will be OK, because, you know, now your mom has volunteered herself into a psych ward. She's eaten off her own hands. Because she, at this point, does not know how to deal with who she is. So now you juxtapose that with these two young people. I'm going to say both of them are 19, even though Merit says she's 18. Um, with Within the time period, we're talking about 18, 19-year-old kids, young mm-hmm. adults, right? They're trying to figure out something that people two, three times older than them haven't figured out yet. And that's the biggest part about figuring out who you are and where you fit in the world is not just finding your tribe, finding your group, finding your community, but finding out who the hell you are within this whole situation. You know, is this something, this idea of me being an eater, is that something, no pun intended, James, is this something that's going to consume me? Is this going to be something that's going to, it's all that's going to matter for my life, you know, just like an addict, like, is my next high the only thing that's going to matter for me? It doesn't matter how I get there. I need to get that next high. And that point where one of the guys at the camp says, oh, have you done bones and all yet? And he describes this, as, oh, you know, it's, you're eating the entire person, um, which I'll get to the math of <laughs> the nutritional <laughs> contents of human beings. <laughs> but when he says like, oh, He's like, yes, that's that's a different thing altogether. That's like being reborn. That's a new kind of high. And the idea that you are now trying to figure out where you are at this point, this gentleman now tells you about another part of your identity that you are nowhere even close to to examining, to exploring, to to, you know, even wanting to take part in. But it's out there. and You realize, like, there's so much shit I don't know. And that's that in itself is what it means to become an adult. You have no fucking idea. I mean, even when it comes to parenthood, you have no fucking idea to do with kids. Or as James, as you pointed out at one of the panels, like it doesn't matter what happens in your life. A test is going to show up. You can say, I like I'm going to do this with my kids. Or if if somebody comes out to me, I'm going to respond this way. Or if somebody needs help, I'm going to do, do it this way. And that you won't know until that test presents itself. And that's the same way it is for for anything. Like if you're a parent, you don't know if you're going to be a good parent or not. You don't know. I mean, it, your kids can tell you you're a good parent, but you're always, at least if you're conscious of it, you're going to always go like, I'm a shitty dad. Like, I can't believe I forgot this. Or I'm a shitty mom because I did this. Um, you're not going to know. And the thing is, no one knows how to conduct themselves as an adult. No one knows how to, we know the rules, but we don't know how to actually adjust ourselves to that with, with, in a way to actually keep our identity. That's, I think there's something very specific with, um, these characters that you see that reflect that, right? Like, Mm -hmm. um, uh, Chalamet's character with his dyed hair, with his, um, he wears a, like a Thundercats shirt at one point, Mm -hmm. which if this is the (laughs) eighties, nerd culture wasn't for everyone. Like it was still like, that would have been a kid's thing. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And then at other points, he's like, he's wearing Marin's shirt at one point. Um, He wears uh, a necklace that almost looks like a pearl necklace. Like he, it's like, he's, he wears that hat, right? He's trying on all these little bits of identity that, may or may not stick may or may Mm -hmm. not become him depending on which parts he believes and kind of the story that he starts to tell about himself. Right. And, and these are those moments like, but I think those moments also happen. Like I'm 44. They're still happening. (laughs) Like you you never get away from that. Uh, And I think that's part of the beauty of, um, this experience we call life, but having the, the awareness, I think that uh, you are kind of constantly making the person who you are and the person who you're going to be 
tomorrow. Like right. we see, um, I don't know if you guys recall, there's a, a diner scene uh, mm-hmm. pretty early on and they're eating breakfast and um, uh, Timothy's, what's it? Lee? Is that his Lee. character's name? Yep. Lee. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. I just always wrote Tim uh, is eating. <laughs> uh, he's eating Lucky Charms, right? Like at this diner, okay. he's eating a kid's cereal. <laughs> where he's I thought cereal. I, I I thought I was I, I didn't see that. I was like, he's not eating cereal, but he, yeah. he's totally eating cereal. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but I didn't even pay attention. Yeah, it's this like little wild thing to me of we're we're really underlining that these are kids who are kind of going through this um, mental, emotional, and probably physical growth period that they're still in. Uh, And I think that that's, it's really, it's cool and it's interesting. And it is um, the thing that drives them uh, is this desire, right? For, for human flesh, uh, but also this desire to grow and to find, I mean, for a while th- to find each other and to find themselves in that other person. There's a lot of great, um, point of view shots, uh, mm-hmm. of, of them kind of looking at each other and these like very intimate close ups. And I think that the filmmaking itself is letting you into that interiority of, um, these decisions that they're making, uh, in these little moments that cause connection and friction. And uh, it's very, it's a very gentle movie for all of the bloodletting that happens. I feel like um, <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of sweet in that way. It really is. And and I, I love stuff that has that element with the horror. Um, mm-hmm. I think I, I think I don't remember which episode, but I recently talked about warm bodies on one of our episodes Mm -hmm. and and it's the same kind of thing. It's just this, this added piece that makes, I mean, uh, like horror is horror, you know, but it just, uh, I don't know. It makes me care more and it makes it more real to me because we aren't stuck in one genre in our daily lives. Right. You know? So anytime you get those, I'm, I'm pretty happy. That's, This one, uh, I think I felt the first time through, at least, that it was a horror movie with a coming-of-age story. This time, I felt I really felt the identity and the coming-of-age portion um, with horror sprinklings. Mm. I could see that. Yeah. Because it's you spend most of your time with them not eating, but James, like you were saying, the kind of the draggy parts um, it, I feel like it builds up in me, this feeling of longing uh, kind of that wistful longing that you might have as a teenager or a young adult uh, just always waiting for something to happen. Um, okay. You know, that, that just that feeling of excitement and there's always possibility, but you have all this time. And I feel like the movie equates that to their hunger. They're, you know, they're, they're eaters hunger, not just in general hunger, but yeah. <laughs> Early on, uh, there, there's that one character, Sully, who makes that comment. And say, oh, I smelled you. I could tell, I could tell you're one of me. Right. Mm-hmm. And to, to, we'll come no back one to, wants we, to be one of him. Well, you know, <laughs> we all have our moments. So at that point, I mean, as a viewer or as a, as a, as a, conscious viewer you're sitting there like oh shit they can smell each other i'm gonna i'm gonna see if i can find all the other eaters in this movie right Mm -hmm. because some are going to be hidden now they didn't hide unless they did but from my viewing i there are some obvious ones and then there's some that it's kind of coded or it's hinted that maybe it's a possibility like there's that little girl at the diner Mm -hmm. that looks up and smiles at them and then kind of keeps watching them. But before that, she kind of has this look up or she looks up in a way. It's kind of like, 
something's odd here. Something's weird. Something's different. Something, you know, something's familiar. Like you have these moments where she's questioning a lot of stuff around her and then she looks over and, and it kind of makes this uh, a cute little face. And you're sitting there like, ah, there's a fucking eater. I found her. <laughs> and then of course you had everybody else, like the, the, the two campers and the two guys who brought the beer, um, where one was an eater and one wasn't. And I just thought that was so, interesting is, is what i'm gonna say um it's so interesting because you have somebody who's choosing to be part of this group as mm-hmm. opposed to somebody who is already part of this group trying to figure out who they are right might not even be comfortable with this um uh, because i think Marin even makes a a comment at one point where she says i don't want to hurt anybody or it might have been lee uh yeah I think it was Lee said, I don't want to hurt anybody. And just the idea of you understand what you're capable of and you have to navigate that because where's this one human? Well, they're all humans. Jesus. Where this one character who's a non eater chooses to take part in this. And the other individual that's with him that that I'm assuming, you know, friend, partner, whatever uh, that's with him. It, it has been an eater and he's the one who recognizes that there's another group there and the, the absolute elation that there's somebody else there like him, an authentic person that's there. That's, that's like him as opposed to, I don't know what, whatever subculture or subgroup that there is where somebody does it because they does whatever this is. They like this music, like this movie, like, you know, whatever celebrity because they want to be accepted as opposed to this is somebody who's already part of that overlord uh, that 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 group who's looking for other members of that group who are authentically themselves so they can actually feel that they're part of something um so i don't know maybe that maybe the other character he was looking for something didn't find it and it's like you know what people taste pretty good let me I, i'm not gonna, i'm not going to turn my nose up at this you know, we all got our we all got our faults. We all got our faults. <laughs> Question for you guys. Uh-huh. I found him to be the most terrifying person in the movie. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so it wasn't just me. I wait, was wait, like, here's the line I wrote. <laughs> the depravity of humans doing things because they can, but don't look at possibly of not doing the act. <laughs> this guy is full on like, fuck it, I'm gonna eat people. I was like, I don't know what it is, but he creeps me out way more than anybody else. It's also the way the fire hits his face, right? It's the way the light from the fire hits his face where you kind of like when when the friend is describing like, oh, yeah, when you go bones and all, blah, 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 blah. (laughs) And he's just looking like, fuck, yeah, I want to I want to go bones and all. I want to be able to do the whole thing. And you're sitting there (laughs) thinking like this is how I I, I don't know how many how many people who who had to deal with addiction that you you've been around but there are people that are trying to get their shit together you know as far as like trying to overcome the addiction or try and live with the addiction or whatever and then you have somebody else who's around them whether we're talking about you know alcoholism or we're talking about drugs or anything like that where you have that one person is like i'm trying to get my shit together i'm trying to find you know some peace blah 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 and then you have somebody say like, you know what? The greatest thing about cocaine or the greatest thing about heroin. And this is the way I heard it described by somebody was heroin feels like you're being hugged by God. Wow. And I remember the way hearing the way it was described. This is a third, uh, third person uh, description. Mm-hmm. And I heard that I was like, I don't ever fucking want to do heroin. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But the way he was describing it or she was, well, anyway, the way the person was describing it, you could see how that would appeal to somebody like I want some. And that's also why you have some people who do drugs or at mm-hmm. least ha- have, you know, it's this idea of like, I need to find something like I'm dealing with whatever it is, but I need to find something. And and people who dealt with addiction talk about that sense of community that's there. Even when you're trying to get over the addiction, there are groups that focus on community like you come to this meeting, you have a new family, you have new friends, you have people who are going to look out for you. Um, but yeah, that, that, that character, yes, James, the, the most terrifying person in the movie. <laughs> and that, that includes the mom who was also terrifying. I didn't find but, her terrifying. I found but her in a different way. 
No, I, mm-hmm. I just found her. I found her to be a sympathetic character. I'd agree with that too. Yeah. Maybe that's just me because I, I I go dark a little bit time uh, a little times, but I felt her sympathetic because it was an issue of she knew the problem, but she wasn't going to get help. So I'm going to check myself into a mental facility, a mental health care facility, so I don't hurt anybody, right? And it seems as though she's had a pretty peaceful existence there for what the 15 years she had been she had been in the facility where she wasn't really you know she didn't have any reports of her attacking anybody because it. She wasn't, other than the nurse, I mean, it's not like they had a guard on her. She was in a padded room, and it was like, hey, uh, she left you this letter that you probably need to read, which is going to lead us to a nice little jump scare part. (laughs) I did appreciate mom waiting until the right part of the letter to attack. I thought Mm -hmm. that was very thoughtful (laughs) of her. Uh, If she attacked right away, it wouldn't have made any sense to the daughter. So... Uh (laughs) I, I honestly, uh, while we're talking about mom, I did appreciate how it wasn't just hunger. She was legitimately trying in her eyes to save her daughter from going through this. It wasn't just, I have to eat. I have to, I have this thing I have to do. Mm-hmm. Like, it sounds like she's learned to control it. You know, like, like you said, the nurse is in there. She's not eating the nurse. She hasn't done anything in all these years. So I did appreciate how it was a different reason to do it. Right. Um, but but it was actually funny to me that it waited till the perfect part of the letter. But <laughs> <laughs> at least she didn't say, grab my strong hand. <laughs> no. Oh no, my god. No. Too soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it is it's that uh interaction with the mother that leads to the couple splitting up for a while. Right. Like it's um, almost that, uh, I don't know, because they're without their son's parents for such a long time, except for, uh, Don, like you were saying, y- you got that, the great uh, Andre Holland uh, mm-hmm. voiceovers. And um, he, I, I love, you have uh, David Gord Green, Michael Stuhlbarg in that um you know, the, the two campers or the guys with the beer, um, you've got, uh, Mark Rylance doing his, his Sully thing, which really only pops up a couple times throughout the movie. Um, they cast all of these people, Chloe Sevigny is the mother. Um, they cast all these people who ca- kind of carry a weight, like character actors who carry a weight with them that can make an impression in such a little amount of time. Right. Uh, and, so you have still kind of like the loving father, even though he's abandoned her. And when um, Chloe Seveny steps in, you know, sits there as, <laughs> as the mother and it just, when it carries over into that next scene and they have their fight of like, who it, it's basically, who are you? Who do you think not in a rude way, but who do you think you are? Right? Like mm. he, he asks her, um, like you, you know, you're afraid to be alone. You're afraid, or tells her you're afraid to be alone. He's calling her out after what she just witnessed. And there's that thing of when you are that age, you don't want to be your parent, no matter what situation they're in. Like you always think that you know better. You think that you can uh, do better than them, um, even if you love and respect them. There's a part of you that you see the world with those youthful eyes that where you want to make a difference and you want to be something more. Right. Uh, and I feel like you get that, that conflict of like, I'm your mother. This is what I tried to do. I'm basically I had to take myself out of uh, being a human, you know, for whatever the eaters are, uh, you know, if they are a different species, technically or whatever, that they have this, um, that's never addressed, which I love. I love that in the story that we never have like a real explanation. There's nothing scientific. There's no, uh, it's all kind of hand waved. It's like, you get it. It's fine. Um, it's a metaphor or something. It's, it's whatever you want it to be, but it's not a grounded scientific explanation that makes it boring and banal and Mm -hmm. takes all the, the literary, uh, ness away from it, right? Like it still carries kind of all this weight. You have uh, the interaction with the mom, and then someone in the next scene, like I'm trying to figure my shit out and be a better person. 
right. like after having that with their parents. And I think that that's really, that's identifiable. Like, and once again, 44 years old, I still go through that with my parents. You still have that. That's a constant that you might have with them. If you're lucky enough to have them around for as long as I have um, that you, you have those interactions where you're like, man, you just don't get it. Do you? I'm going to do something else. I, uh, I try not to interact with my mom and, uh, oh, wait, no, that wasn't the point of this. Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's, uh, you know, I spent the last week with my in-laws, so I'm feeling it right now. I'm in it. <laughs> Good God. Yeah, I'm not going to join in this conversation, so. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we'll just move forward then. Beautiful. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to flip a question. Uh, what do you think the everything in a movie is on purpose? Okay. So I don't know uh, if this was directly from a book or not, but um, uh, Marin is in an interracial couple. She's the mm-hmm. product of an interracial uh, couple in the eighties in Midwest America. What is the weight? Is that just, adding to her otherness or her identity that she would have in that context? Um, or is it trying to get past that? Is it commenting on it or is it moving away from that being an issue at all by um, we're just, you know, casting for the most, the best actors in the roles? You know, I, because some people are subtle with it. And some of sometimes you have people that try to hit you over the head with whatever it is, you know, the, the metaphor, the allegory that's that's playing out. Mm-hmm. I honestly don't think that's what they did. I think this was um, when you you had the interracial couple to uh, her parents. Right. Mm-hmm. To explain her presentation uh, more accurately. But I mean, as far as like you can you can ar- make that argument. I shouldn't say that is what happened, but you can make that argument. Um, but I don't think so because it's never played up as you never get this moment where where Marin says, "Well, you don't know what it's like. I'm 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 this and I'm this." Mm-hmm. So it's never it's never presented, and there's never a moment where somebody else seems to come at her, uh, right. certain, you know, a certain way by calling her any one of the derogatory terms there would have been for for a mixed kid or a kid who is not who has seen more one than the other. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause there's not even a moment where, you know, she gets invited to come hang out and, 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 you know, one of the other girls is like, Oh my God, you're going to invite an Oreo to the part, you know, something. Right. Stupid. There's never. So I think it can be seen that way because if you talk about lived experiences, um, you do have this thing where of course, well, I mean, I'm not going to eating people is illegal. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's frowned upon, but you can kind of look at it from the from the standpoint of I feel weird because I'm in this world in this body, right? So you could see it as you know a, a story about racial identity or or understanding one's racial identity, right? Mm-hmm. Um, where she's she's in that body and she doesn't have a choice of being in that body. In the same way that, or the same vein as, she doesn't have a choice in eating people. I mean, you have a choice in who you eat, mm-hmm. but the hunger is going to drive you to do it. Um, so you could make that argument of it's still that same battle of this is not something I can control. You know, you could even include sexuality in that as well, because there was a point where I honestly thought Lee, uh, they were queer coding him so many times. And where did I, I just wrote down the queer thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I put down, you could also look at this at any of these changes as far as it's a, na- it's a normal, it's a natural process. It's a normal existence. It's just that society that may be deeming that there's something wrong with you based off your racial identity, uh, based off of what's going on with your body and puberty. Like you're not recognizing who you are. Like when, when she talks about, I'm just becoming aware of this uh, or I'm, I'm just remembering, she says, I'm just remembering all the stuff because she's been listening to her father's uh, cassa- her recordings on the cassette mm-hmm. that that idea of when you're going through puberty and you know, you're progressing through it. 
things are changing so much in your body and so much in your mind. And, and you know, your hormones are affected you in, in such a way to that the shit that you worried about pre-puberty ain't nothing compared to what you're worrying about during puberty. And then once you've gone through puberty and you a certain number of years have passed, you look back on like, what the fuck was I worried about? Getting an erection in class? Holy shit. <laughs> what? That was what I was worried about. <laughs> I had a bone. You know, it's here. Here's the thing. I mean, just to to go off on this tangent, talking about how people cover things up and and get weirded out by this, right? So you have a racial examination that's possible. Mm -hmm. You have a sexuality component that can be discussed because you know it doesn't seem as though she's had a close relationship close sexual relationship with anybody right she's right. obviously got a close close relationship with her father but there's not been a close physical relationship with anybody um and you kind of get that indication when she goes to the girls party where she's starting to feel something and then acts upon it but then her hunger takes over right so you got queerness you got the idea of becoming free from all these constraints but with puberty, you do all these things to cover it up, right? So you, if you happen to be, you know, if, if from, from what friends have told me about when they start developing girls, when they start developing, coming up with different ways to wear clothing to where their buds are not showing, like the, the budding mm -hmm. and the growing of the breast is not showing, right? And then you'll have boys, primarily, cisgender men who will... A, a, a nice breeze comes through and you have an erection, mm -hmm. right? You have this one thought in, in science class or, or PE or wherever, and you don't know when it's going to go down. Sorry for all the erection talk, but you know, we need to have more talks like these, but the idea that you're so embarrassed of what's going to happen, your thoughts are, please don't call me up to the board. Please, Mr. Smith, Mrs. Jackson, don't mm -hmm. call me up to the board. Please don't do it. Because you know everybody is going to, or at least you feel, everybody's going to be looking at my crotch. Everybody's going to be looking at my crotch because I can feel like a nervous boner is going to pop up out of nowhere, right? Or you already have one. So then it comes, it comes to the point where I'm going to take my books or my notebook up there with me to cover it up. There's nothing that you should be embarrassed about. Same thing with queerness. You have kids, and I'm since we're talking about kids, you have kids that hide who they are because of whatever social conventions, mores, norms that they have to deal with within their their close peer groups. Of I can't be who I am around any of you because I don't know how it's safe. So when you start talking about in the film, they start talking about being able to smell each other. People of those groups typically know. And can easily find people that are in those groups that will fit into those groups. Mm -hmm. So you'll often have people who are queer, who are somewhere on, on the spectrum, right? They will talk to somebody who is still having that sexual awakening or trying to figure out who they are. And they will simply offer them an ear and talk to them about, you know, their feelings, talk to them about, you know, what they're, uh, you know, uncomfortable with, what they're comfortable with, and actually give them an unbiased, candid packet of, of, uh, or, or, of tools or toolbox to use to understand who they are. Now, of course, with anything, you're going to have somebody who's a predator because you're going to have the same thing with, within the heterosexual community. But you will have people saying like, that person's obviously gay. Whatever that happens to me, that person is obviously this because they have already had their moment where they've come to realize what their identity is and they see somebody else who's struggling with it. Mm -hmm. And so they will offer that up to them. And the same thing with, in the case of Marin, if it if she were dealing with her racial identity, there would be somebody at one point who would come to her and say, like, hey, when I was your age, I was worried about sounding like this or sounding like that. And now I don't give a fuck what anybody thinks about me because, one, they're not paying my bills. And then, two, they don't have any control over my life. So why should I worry about what their definition of being black is? or what their definition of being queer is, or their definition of being whatever this marginalized group is, because I'm going to determine what that what that is going to be. And I start to see this throughout the film where, one, she's trying to figure out what she's supposed to be, but then starts to put together what she wants to be and how she wants her life to be reflected. And unfortunately, Sully shows up and fucks everything up for her. 
Yes. <laughs> we we have this moment where you know you have people in your community that are not going to make a make the situation safe for you. And that's exactly what I was wondering about with, uh, you know, if we're talking with movie as metaphor, uh, what portion, what faction Sully brings in? Because the, you know, uh, Lee and Marin, they talk about when they were kids, um, you know, the first time that they ate, uh, you know, Marin attacked a babysitter. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it's almost this this continuation, this thread of uh, which you could view as gender identity or sexual orientation of I was always this way. Right. I, I always knew it. Even from a young age, I knew it. Um, and, you know, they're growing into these people and you, they see around them the people that they do and do not want to emulate. And they talk about who they want to be. And then Sully comes in with. Is he. He's obviously um, coded as a predator, even when he's being kind. Like mm. there's, he's played as being off and being creepy and being. Um, I remember when uh, I was a tween, probably. Um, my mom managed a grocery store, and there was a, a guy there that she was like, "Yeah, don't talk to him by yourself." Mm. And it was just kind of known that, you know, he was, uh, uh, yeah, there was, uh, the certain parlance of the times that I won't go into <laughs> necessarily, but, uh, you know, uh, attracted to children, right. uh, at least had that, that reputation. And it was just kind of, you know, this would have been the late eighties. Um, and it would have had the same kind of thing of like, Oh, he's kind of okay about other stuff, but you just don't talk to him. You don't, you know, don't let, don't trust your kids around him. Right. Um, is yeah. Sully kind of coded as that, do you think? Or is he, um, what is his purpose? Or is he just someone in your own community that you can't trust that might be a predator and preys on people who have similar interests or tastes or predilections that he might capitalize on and can isolate you uh, based on that. I, I completely took him as a groomer, like okay. from, from the, from the first moment, like, and even, I mean, the, the way they presented it, or at least the way, the, the way the story carries on, I'm thinking like, well, maybe I'm too harsh on Sully. Maybe this is going to be the guy who saves her. From, mm-hmm. from Lee, like maybe Lee is the, the <laughs> fucked up one, because we typically have this moment where uh, I, I will always think back to when I was in third or fourth grade. We had one of those um, choose your own adventure stories in the school paper. And one of the kids who wrote it, because one of the options was turn left and you can go to the there's an old man who's, you know, offering to help turn right. There's a beautiful woman who is, you know, saying that she has food ready for you or whatever. Right. So if, if you went to the woman, you got killed. Okay. And if you went to the old Story man, of my life, <laughs> <laughs> when you went to the old man, you, he, he gave you a place to stay, gave you food. You know, he got you medical care, what, whatever it was. I mean, it's been like 30 years or longer than that. God. God. Uh, so, when I asked it, because I, I I knew the the kid who was in fifth grade, because I think I was in third or fourth, but I knew the kid, and I I asked him, I was like, I said, why'd you guys put that in the in the paper? Like, why was the 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 girl bad, and the in the old man was because even the way they described the old man, it was like, oh, he's very ready hair, and he has this, and the, um, and he has scars on his face. So the way they 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 described him, it was very unflattering, right? And what the, the 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 young man told me at the time, he was older than me, but the, what the other kid told me was, we you shouldn't automatically think that somebody is bad because they're not physically appealing. So whenever I go into films like this, since then, I always look, you know, I have a couple of rules. Like, if you did not see the person die, they're not dead. And then two, mm-hmm. appearances, as far, you can't judge a good character as far as a hero protagonist or antagonist based off of the way they look, because some of the pretty, uh, I can't remember who I'm quoting now, but some of the prettiest people do the, do the ugliest things. 
And nice. that moment where Sully comes out, I'm like, well, I don't want to be too harsh on him. He's giving me a creepy vibe, but I don't want to be too harsh because when you look back on it, you can see that he's trying to groom her. Cause he's like, Hey, I smelled you from half a mile away. You know, we can all have this talent. We can all do blah, 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 blah. And then he talks about the woman that's in the house, whether he actually killed her or not, you know, he could have, because it's very clear that he, he has no problem with killing uh, when the, uh, you know, toward the end of the film. But the idea that, He's now telling her, like, yeah, this is how you live. This is the way things are. Everything will be great. So you get this sense of it's partial relief of from him. I found somebody else who's in my tribe. But then, two, I found somebody I can mold. And the best nice. thing that that she does is she leaves because her senses go off of, like, this is not a good situation, whether it happens to be because he's an old man, I'm a young girl, or, you know, I'm by myself, any of those things, right? Those alarms go off and she gets on that bus and gets the hell out of there. And then you see him come back a couple of times and he progressively gets more aggressive each time that that he interacts. And what I see from that, Jason, is, is the idea that if there is somebody that's part of a community that you fit into, you're not going to always get along with people in that community. Just because they're in your community does not mean they're going to make you feel welcome or you're not going to feel welcome around them. They may have some ulterior motives because, hey, it's one of my people. We'll get along just fine. It's going to be great. I mean, there are numerous stories of of immigrants coming to the United States, uh, especially during the Gilded Age, during the late 19th century, where people were from a certain ethnic background, a national background, and they would con people coming off the boats like oh you're from ireland so am i what town me too that's my mother went to that church or my mother did whatever so they would actually be able to get their political support for something or get a kickback for sending them to a certain boarding house you know there were these ways that they would be able to look out for themselves in the name of looking out for somebody else and i think that's that's what you have with sully it's he's even convinced himself like I'm doing what's best. I'm doing what's best, not just for me, but for you. Like you're not going to be able to survive this life. And I mean, you could also look at him as being somebody who's old and bitter. You know, he's, she's getting to have that life and Lee's getting to have that life that maybe he would have wanted, but he just didn't know how to deal with, with his affliction, with his, with his curse. I want to, uh, I want to take this back to Josh's question from before, and I'm going to pull this all back into Sully. So you asked about the interracial couples throughout this and whether it was purposeful or not. And I absolutely believe it is. And I believe that Sully's characterization plays into it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So here we go. All right. Uh, Basically, the title of the movie is My Reasoning. The title of the movie is Bones and All. And when you get down to bones, skeletons, it doesn't matter what your skin color was. It doesn't matter what your gender was. It doesn't matter anything. You're just skeletons. Everybody's the same. You're just bones, right? Okay. And, and so Sully is attracted to her. This is very obvious, right? Mm-hmm. Like, especially given the end, he only sees skin deep with her. He only sees a cute black girl he wants to fuck. All the rest is grooming behavior. It's all bullshit. But I also feel like you could assign the symbolism of of white culture. Sully is the person that gives her rules. And this is how we do things. And and he basically says, let me keep you in line without saying that. I'm saying Mm -hmm. if you assign this symbolism. And so he's literally going after a black girl and making her one of the good ones who follows the rules and does what old Sully wants. And and so in that way, I think maybe the interracial couples do matter. They are breaking the rules. They're not following what Sully wants, whether it's that, whether it's, uh, you know, even the rules about eating other eaters. Nobody seems to live by that. Like, like Lee doesn't like immediately go, Oh yeah, that's a rule. We gotta, gotta make sure that's right. always true. Mm-hmm. You know, like it's just something she repeats that Sully said, it's not an established rule. And, uh, and so I don't know, there's just, there's this big thing for me 
about how you can roll all of that into racial discussions and just uh, even age discussions. Like if you take race out of it, it's still an older person trying to give you the rules of how things have to be. And then instead she finds a community that wants to not even necessarily have rules. They have rules. Uh, she's super pissed when they kill the one guy and then he has a family. So they have rules that they're following, but they're not necessarily the same old order rules, you know? And maybe I'm going way too deep with this, but that's my take. No, no, I can, I can definitely see that. Um, I, I could definitely see how that works. That's, I think even there's something, uh, Don said, you, you said, uh, something along the lines of like a bitter person. Uh, right. You know, I think it's the same thing. Like somebody who maybe came up in a less forgiving era who mm -hmm. was still trying to keep those strictures on the people below them or that they consider to be below them, those younger than them and those that are vulnerable, uh, and might be bitter for the opportunities that they get. Like you were saying the, the life that they get to live um, maybe, and you know, this might be a, a harmful stereotype, but of um, the, the bitter older queer who mm. is, you know, even somewhat upset about the acceptance that somebody might feel today. And I think kind of setting it in the eighties, you, you could feel that friction a little bit more where uh, today, you know, thankfully, um, and some places are trying to reverse it, but the idea that uh, in general society is more accepting um, and the, the older generation might be bitter, whatever your subculture is, the older generation might be bitter and trying to hold the younger generation down a little bit. Uh, I think, you know, it kind of melds your guys' points um, and I can totally see it. It, you know, it lines up with, both my lived experience and my reading of this. Yeah, I'm thinking I think about that's a fascinating think, take. Yeah, I'm thinking about Sully in those same lines now. As far as it, it, as far as that generation that came before, not just the generation of eaters, but the same thing with respect to because I've heard this from 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 some people. I, I guess you could qualify them as bitter um, within the queer community who said things like. Oh man, these kids now get to everybody gets to be gay, and blah. I'm like, wasn't that the fucking goal? Mm -hmm. Wasn't that? I mean, that not like everybody will be, but as far as like everybody who is and who identifies, shouldn't they be allowed to? Because I'm not going to name names. James knows who I'm going to be talking about. Uh, but I have individuals uh, who are part of the part of that spectrum that will quickly shit on another part of the spectrum, mm -hmm. and it's. It's like, well, you know, now trans people have more. Actually, I guess James can think about more than a, one person. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but, like, but, but the whole thing. I think of, we all know these people. But well, yeah. Continue. Well, okay. So generic person who who is bitter about <laughs> the 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 status. Can that become this, a thing on the show? So generic person was. Yes, generic anyway, person. Continue. Generic person A. <laughs> uh, you know, I've heard people say this shit, and I'm like, you are in the community. It, but well, I'm not trans. But, what the fuck does that have to do with anything where they will simply say something like, well, trans people have more rights than, 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 than we, than everybody else. And then you start breaking it down. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Well, you know, they're playing sports. I'm like, you've got three people, you got three trans athletes that we know of that are out there. Like they're not dominating. And it, like, even if you think about the swimmer, her, her scores at her times have gotten slower. Like she's not, she doesn't have any advantage, but just the idea that you have people that will now look at other parts of the community and think this part of the community has more rights or has more avail availability, more access, more resources, whatever. And we had to fight for those things when I was, when I was coming up, you were fighting for those things because holy shit, it was supposed to get to this point. Um, and me being other than some of the grad students that were in the same program, I had a, had a, we didn't have an argument. I mean, it was more of a discuss a disagreement and discussion um, where someone genuinely asked me, they said, Oh, you know, is, is, are, are things better or worse for black people now than in the sixties? And I said, it depends. I would make the argument that things are going backwards, not that they're worse, but they're going backwards. Mm -hmm. And this, the student who is, who is non-black uh, responded and said, well, I think John, John Lewis would say, I was like, no, 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 no. You got to understand John Lewis saw some shit. 
I'm not talking about getting your ass beaten in the street. I'm not talking about any of this stuff, you know, about voting rights. But the fact that you have a serious concern that voting rights are being taken away from people, I would say that we're in a worse situation because you have people that look at this and say, well, you know, we fought for this stuff and, you know, it's 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 going away. And then when people try to fight for those rights again, you have you you're met with roadblocks. You're met with, uh, in, in some cases, tear gas and and rubber bullets because you're simply trying to exercise your First Amendment right, and you you get received this way. Or the way in which the media would take it up and say like, well, you know, the police were legitimate, uh, legitimately shot this person or beat this person or whatever it is. So now it's whatever movement you're wrapped up in gets disparaged by Fox News, One America, Newsmax, whatever whatever it happens to be, um, because they don't like the way in which you protested or they don't like what you're protesting about or they make the argument of, well, people can vote. I don't understand what the problem is. And it's the same thing with that you would have that other generation coming down on the newer generation that's saying, like, I should be able to work a job and not get fired for being gay. And their response is, well, you don't want to work someplace like that in the first place. Mm-hmm. That's not that's not the point. I want to be able to have the freedom to work in a trade, in a field where I'm comfortable, what I like to do. And I should not have to worry about somebody doesn't like the fact that I'm gay or lesbian or trans or whatever. And they're going to use that as as rationale to fire me, to to have me lose my job, which, again, was legal up until two years ago. Uh, of course, we're doing this in 2023. So it was legal up until 2020, 2021. Um, but thankfully, the, the su- Supreme Court made the right decision to ban the, that type of uh, dismissal when it came to employment. But, I mean, we'll, we'll wait and see what <laughs> what, ha- what happens in the near future, because I have a feeling that uh, that may get revisited. Ain't that the truth? So anyway, when is straight pride month? I was just wondering, fellas, since we're talking about this. <laughs> what is I believe that's uh July through May. And then uh, also in June, where they get really loud and whine about it a lot. Uh, the worst. Was that I gotta, too honest? I'm sorry. Look, I gotta <laughs> say, if if you're seriously wondering when men's month is and when straight month is and when Christian month is, you must have an easy fucking life. <laughs> <laughs> you, you must have no fucking complaints in the world to 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 invent a crisis where none exists. Oh my god! So anyway, <laughs> well, here was one line, and I'm going to ask the two of you this. Well, one, uh, I have to uncross this part talking about Sully's rule on my notes because that that was you talk about terrifying moments. That was that that tore me apart. Um, because he did way too well in that scene mm-hmm. with, the, with the drool. But um, Marin and Lee are having a discussion, and and um, it's that part of the movie where you're like, "All right, things might work out, or they might go to shit." And this line hits, which is, "Let's be people." Oh yeah, yeah, yeah! Holy shit! Like you look at lines that by themselves mean nothing, but given the context of this. That has a lot of weight. It's simply, I mean, they could have said, let's be normal, but let's be people means that they felt as though they were not the same as everybody else, but that that's what they want. So it's no longer, I want to find my tribe. I want to find my group. I want to just, I want to not, not, not even be invisible. I just want to be not looked at. I don't want to be seen as different. But that's what it meant for me. But I mean, that that line as far as like, let's be people or just the idea of being people. What does that mean to to either of you? Um, it is something that I've heard elsewhere in my life as well or or used mm-hmm. uh, the the phrase, you know, basically like um and this is coming from once again, I hadn't thought of it in this context before, but uh, a few years back, I had my diagnosis of uh, bipolar disorder, which 
certainly explains a lot of things in my 20s and 30s and, and the way that I reacted to things. And uh, being on medication and going to therapy has definitely helped that. Uh, but when that first happened, the the thought of like, oh, I can I can be a person amongst people. Mm. Like that was the thought. That was the like, I can finally kind of uh, fit in and perform the tasks that are required, um, but also gain the benefits. Okay. Uh, that you see with getting to be, um, and you know, it is different because there's not a lot of um, benefits that you get from being an unmedicated bipolar person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's not like uh, being a part of any other group, you know, some kind of illness pretty much only has downsides. <laughs> and, uh, but you do get to understand the beauty and complexity of who you are and put it into a shape that can function in the, the world and modern society. And that's kind of how I feel about their decision of like, we're going to remain ourselves, uh, but we're going to be ourselves in this in this world uh, amongst other people. And I think that that's kind of uh, the the direction that they take of like, you know, for them, it's like they get to play house for a little bit and they get to be people. And who knows how long it would have continued um, if Sully didn't step in. Right. Uh, I also think there's a a thread of um uh Marin reading books throughout the mm -hmm. uh you know and she reads is it the hobbit or lord of the rings it's a token book earlier earlier on um and then she is reading clan of the cave bear right. when they're they're playing when they have their time when they're their people uh which is if i'm not misremembering like about a a tribe early on and like basically uh evolving into humans mm -hmm. like that let's be people it's carried through the whole the whole thing and uh i don't know i think it's a great sentiment uh for somebody who would be deciding to settle down or, or to get to change and try to fit in but still retain your identity that's really cool i had no idea what that book was about so wow well, I watched the movie as a kid because Daryl mm -hmm. Hannah was in it. Yes, she was. <laughs> and she she was naked in the movie. <laughs> well, I'm and, amazed I didn't see it now. And I, I just remember watching it as a kid and thinking like, oh, this is actually pretty interesting. Because <laughs> I think at one point she has a baby and like, uh, run, well, that's a different movie. Anyway, if you've seen the movie, you know, I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. You can look up your own spoilers, James. I probably won't, but thanks. <laughs> Here, here's here's part of me being jealous not in a sully jealous way but just the the jealous looking back on this and thinking about what the 80s were and i was glad that the 80s looked like the 80s as opposed to whatever cocaine fueled fever dream that people have when they say we're having an 80s party and they do it i'm like that's not what the 80s looked like at all i mean mm -hmm. <laughs> So when you when they go into that one place, uh, I, I, you know the I can't remember was the trailer or the 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 other house that they the lake house they'd gone to, but the idea that it was wood paneling everywhere, I'm mm -hmm. like, yep, that's what it looked like. That's exact. <laughs> you had wood paneling every fucking where. Um, You're saying everything did not look like Batman forever. No, it didn't, James. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, but I. My my question is looking back on this, and I and I and I, this was that moment of where I, like I said, I became jealous, but not in the the sully sully type jealousy, but the idea of holy shit, I remember just the idea, the time when you would have no worries, no issues, other than, you know, oh, where are we gonna stop? You know, what am I gonna what am I gonna eat today? But not, you know, am I gonna be able to eat? But the the sheer sense of I don't have any fucking responsibilities. I'm going to get in this car with this person I just met and we're just going to go, we're going to ride. We're going to, we're going to go on a trip. And just the way in which there's no social media, there's no anything that's kind of tethering you at all. And the way that they're able to do this. And this is a great way to kind of explore and find out who you are. It's like, I'm just going to go on this 
I'm going to get a car and I'm going to drive. And I, I love that that's an added element as well, as opposed to um, she's stuck in this one town trying to figure out who she is. Uh, and, and even the announcement, the, the way that the, the graphics work, where it's like, hey, <laughs> we're in Maryland now. Now we're in Nebraska. Now we're in Indiana. Now we're here. Um, just the way it's showing you, one, how much time has passed, how much ground they've covered. Um, and even the fact that they're staying in this truck that's all beat up after the the, the guy at the service station is like, yeah, your rods are done. You, you're going to need a new engine. I saw the car. I was like, look around. Where are you going to get? Where are you going to go? <laughs> mm-hmm. How are you going to get anywhere away from here? Um but if you sell me your car right now, or you sell me this truck right now, it's not going to happen. And just, I just, I, I, I was in love with it. I know that James, you talked about um, going with your dad, like on the on the weekends for like sales and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I know your answer is, you know, you didn't have any <laughs> adventures like this. Uh, but Josh, did, did did you ever experience anything like this? Like I'm just going to get in the car and drive for a few hours and see where I end up. Oh, that was like every weekend uh, once I got my license, Mm. you know, it was like I would drive up to Chicago sometimes or just up into Michigan kind of uh, wherever. And I mean, very specifically, which would tie into this, I think um, I would go on a Friday uh, to like Borders, Barnes and Noble, Media Mm -hmm. Play, uh, and I would pick up some books and some CDs every week. You know, that was like, it was like my ritual. And then the next day I would just drive and listen to it. And then I'd stop if I could find a park or something. Sometimes I stop stop next to a cornfield because it's Indiana and we had a lot of cornfields. Um, Mm -hmm. And I would like take some photos or read my new book. um, And the, the way that this kind of captures that, uh, the isolation that you can feel in mm-hmm. a wide open space. Okay. You know, like the, the sense of being cut off despite being able to see everything for 16 miles around until there's a next rise in the road. Uh, <laughs> it, it's yep. really, you know, it, it, that's what it feels like. That's what it's, you know, I'm getting ready in a few weeks to go back up North to see my folks. And I'm, you know, it changes my brain the way that my brain imagines things. Um, it feels like it bounces off mountains, but it's just, it, it is expansive and the possibilities are expansive uh, when you're in those, those plain states, at least for me, having grown up there. Yeah. yeah I mean, same uh, me and my friends would just get in the car and be like, let's go out to the western side of Nebraska because there's nothing out there. But my cousin lived out there and it would literally be a spur of the moment choice at like 10 p.m. Mm-hmm. And we'd just drive out there and then we'd hang out at like the lake or whatever. And then I don't know how many times and I don't know why my aunt and uncle put up with this. But my aunt and uncle had a beautiful farm. And I don't know how many times we just randomly showed up at like 830 in the morning and went, can we get breakfast? And they would just make <laughs> breakfast for like four of us. Like, it was so fucking weird. Like, I look at that now and I was like, if you came to my house, you'd be starving because I wouldn't open the fucking door, you know? But, uh, <laughs> but no, man, there's something absolutely magical. Like, you talk about getting lost out there and there's a terror factor to it in the no one can save me out here. But there is a beautiful piece where you can see like three states from where you are and you can see the entire Milky Way at night. And and there's something there that makes you feel completely powerful and completely meaningless at the same time. And I miss mm-hmm. that so much. And and that I, I feel like that feeling is what we were looking for driving out there all the time. And that's the I love hearing that, James. I love uh you know, I'm getting little goosebumps because like of recognition from that. Uh, and the fact that my 17 year old who just graduated, um, has told me about experiences that she's had that are really, really similar. Like that, that's still a thing that happens. It's like this connecting tissue that we all have of, um, you're driving around looking for something and you don't know what it is yet. Uh, because you know, 
you're a teenager and you're just looking. <laughs> you, you're yeah. you're desiring. You're you're wanting the whole world. Um, and God, like as you got into specifics, I remembered I would drive up to the dunes, the Warren Dunes, um, and look out across the Lake Michigan, and that just makes you feel so tiny, so so small. Uh, oh yeah. And I mean, you're basically looking at the ocean because that's all you can see, you know? Yes. Like, same feeling. Yeah. Um, which that, um, the ocean specifically, uh, or large bodies of water or small bodies of water at this point, give me the same feeling of staring into space, like existentially threatening uh, situation <laughs> of just, uh, I'm so little and I could disappear into that and never be heard from again. But yet I am the viewpoint. I am the vantage point for this whole thing, which could be the whole of existence as I see it right now. Like those two things combined and you feel that in your body and in your heart at that moment. And I feel like there's so much of this movie. I mean, the movie ends on a, on them overlooking the planes like that. Like it ends with a skin to skin contact moment of them together mm -hmm. looking out over the planes and it feels, you know, uh, plot wise, thematic wise, whatever that moment feels very real to me, feels very true. Yeah, man. You just like, you tapped so many of my feelings about like oceans and water and stuff, which is <laughs> a huge theme in my next book, Caduceus. And, uh, and I, I feel like I need to go back and rewrite one scene now because of <laughs> this feeling and how I need to add it. Cause it didn't even occur to me that, that that's something I was writing. And uh, so now, now when people say, what is this book about Josh, you'll be able to say, well, what James meant when he wrote Caduceus. <laughs> well, uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding. I just is had that to roll that it's in. Supposed to be? <laughs> Absolutely. Always, always speak for the author. Uh, never speak for yourself. <laughs> <laughs> if we've learned anything here today, it's <laughs> that the author is alive and well, that's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and they have no Take idea. That, what Roland Bart what their own work was about. Oh, precisely. We brought up the idea of bones and all, I mean, more than just the title, mm -hmm. but yeah. what do you think at least, what do you think that would be like? And I, and, and talked about heroin and, and, and the high that that one camper kind of describes, but um, why do you think that would be a different status to have or a different, stage to have as as part of this or or would it even represent something outside of this world okay that's really interesting like i get it within the, the very specific context of the eaters mm -hmm. i get it within the context of a love story of loving somebody bones and all meaning yes. you know to the core of them but also everything that they are their warts their uh you know their less desirable features or features that they might not like about themselves but you yourself love in them um or you it's literally a hard thing to chew like i mean yes yes, yes. <laughs> oh <God> damn it <laughs> you know what it works this time, though. It's not even uh, I'm not even taking points off for that one. I like it. <laughs> Look, I wouldn't calculate it because I, I looked in, in a few different places to determine what that would what that would be uh, mm -hmm. calorically. So, from what they typically eat, you as really far as did the, this. that's fantastic. I did I? I was so curious. I'm like, when, I'm gonna finally. You said look it up. earlier. I thought it was a joke, but I was like, nope. I also know Don well enough. He <laughs> might have done this. So continue. I, I went, I looked it up at several different sites of medical sites that, that calculated how much it would be, which I'm sure I'm on a watch list. If I'm not already on one already, <laughs> because I typed in how many calories in human flesh. <laughs> so huh? oh the, my. the skeletal, as far as like your muscle and your fat, as far as like your your visceral stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Not organs, not bones, just the muscle and fat on your body. The the average human being, thirty three thousand calories. Whew. If That's you Michael ate, Phelps levels, I know. If you ate all, you know the the flesh, the organs, and the bones, 
127,000 calories. Wow. So my question is, I, I guess an additional question, this is more rhetorical. Like, would the person's diet, because I even thought about diseases, <laughs> but would the person's diet determine your overall health? So if the person was a vegan, or if they happen to be, you know, high protein, low sugar, or high sugar, whatever, like, would their actual, the the, the their body composition from what they eat, determine your overall health? I mean, I would think it would have to. Are, now, are this you... is in no way me trying to say that I'm going to start eating people. I was just, I'm just curious because we talk about grass-fed beef and free-range chicken and things like that being better for you. I mean, would, would human beings really vary that much in nutritional content? Uh, so you're asking... Are you what they eat? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for going down this road with me, Jason. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I love it because that means if someone were to consume me, the they're consuming the power of so many cheeseburgers and chocolate <laughs> shake meals that I treat myself right. to. <laughs> That's me, like making sure I have good marbling. Yeah, okay? I'm gonna be way tastier than that. That that Timothy, what's his name in this film? Because he's very Medina. skinny and lean, and and I'm very marbled. So I would say I'm gonna be a way more delicious meal, but I'm gonna affect your heart more. So mm -hmm. it's give and take, you know. Uh, you're gonna be you're gonna be unctuous. There's there's gonna be uh, like a great mouth feel. To you, James, uh, I got to say. I've heard that. All right, we're yeah. going to have to save that audio. <laughs> I've, I've heard that, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Chalamet, man, he's he can make a good jerky, perhaps. <laughs> knock, knock, um, knock. Are you guys talking about eating people? No, Mr. Fowler, <laughs> we're just... Oh. <laughs> Fantastic. Good stuff, good stuff. Oh man, I feel as though James is going to do a double feature with an Army Hammer movie. Hell yeah! Okay, <laughs> there we go. So he was in "Call Me by Your Name." Yeah, together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, is this his therapy for <laughs> dealing with that? <laughs> well, yeah, because it came out well after the allegations. So yeah, or I should say they He's filmed after notes. the allegations. Taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let me ask you about this part of my movie for no reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. All that audio became evidence. Do you guys have anything else or are you ready to head to movie wrecks? Uh, I'm good with movie wrecks if you guys are. Yeah, Josh? I think so. That's all right. Well, you're up first, Mr. Guest. If people liked this, what else should they watch? I'm going super, super duper obvious with uh, Suspiria. Okay, I nice. think there's something tonally that Luca Luca Guadagino uh, does that man. If you are in the rhythm of it, right? Like because each movie teach, teaches you how to watch it within the first few minutes. You you understand the rhythm, you understand the pacing, you understand the visual language, and right. The fact that a lot of these things are kind of carried over between these two films, especially, um, even though one is much more cold and sterile, uh, and this one is more lush and an open feeling, that's just the setting. The language that he uses is very similar, and I think if you're if you're into this vibe, uh, going there is a is a probably a it's a it's an easy street to cross to get over there. I'd say. Nice. Yeah. I've. I feel like this is a double feature that Don saw coming a mile away. I'm going with my favorite movie of last year. Fresh. God damn it. Ooh. Fresh would be such a great double feature with this film uh, for obvious reasons. But also, I just I really love them in very different ways. And I think a lot of the other themes play in as well. Uh, you know, like particularly trying to find somebody, find your tribe, find somebody that you think you're clicking with. And uh you know, and things go sideways and fresh really fast. 
well, not really fast, 37 minutes in. But uh, <laughs> I just, I feel like uh, these two would be really fun together. Okay. All right, Don, 421 movies. 420, because you took you took fresh from me. I got you to say it. I'm amazing. Fresh, All right. Fresh was the first one I wrote down. Like I was two minutes into the movie when she bit the girls. Like, oh, fresh. <laughs> All right. Like, so he loves that film. That's the double feature. <laughs> let's go with yes, Raw. Go uh, Raw mm -hmm. Paper Towns, which isn't a horror film, but it is a coming of age, trying to figure out who you are. Uh, Parasite. Another good one. Uh, let the right one in. Because it is, well, I'm not even going to give rationale for it. Renfield. Uh, no Country for Old Men. Land, I'm sorry. Yeah, Land of the Dead and Dawn of the Dead. Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Ravenous. Uh, the Exorcist. The entire Dexter series. Um, because it was that whole idea of trying to figure out if you're a good person or not. And spoiler mm -hmm. alert, Dexter is not a good person. Uh, and a really shitty father. So, <laughs> the Hills Have Eyes. Uh, the Delicatessen, a movie that I still need to get James to watch, which is Doomsday. And uh, Motel Hell, the classic Motel nice. Hell. Okay. I uh, use, was pulled up. I, had I use up. preservatives. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, my. I love that that was his confession. Uh, I use preservatives. <laughs> If you've seen the movie, you get the joke. If you haven't seen the movie, go go fix that and go watch it so you can laugh at that line. Go fix your life and go watch <laughs> it, frankly. That's that is a lot of work you're asking for. Fixing my life. My gosh. <laughs> oh. There are entire networks dedicated to fixing people's lives. I didn't say they did it, they're just dedicated to it. Can I just say how much I would love if like Food Network just did like a cannibal series during ha Halloween and just acted like it was totally normal? That would oh, just, man. that'd be so fantastic. I'm down. Anyway. So then you have the barbecue, you have Master Chef. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Here we have Greg. <laughs> Eat Bobby Flay. <laughs> anyway, so. Uh... <laughs> no, I feel like he'd be too bitter of a meal. Uh, <laughs> nice. Just Michael Simon standing over talking about the seasoning that he used on Bobby. That'd be great. Who's the All right, let's bring it this, this week. <laughs> <laughs> let's bring it back to you, Josh. Uh, where can people find you online and all that good stuff? Um, I believe if you look up uh, Josh Ickes on any of the major, I tried to change all of my uh, socials to either be Spartacus, it's S P A R T I C K E S, or Josh Ickes. Uh, same same spelling. Uh, you can find me, and as always, check out my other podcasts. Um, I'd love to have either one of you guys on as well, especially the Nashville CA, because um, that one's a great show with guests. Mm. Uh, and yeah, uh, also check out the the most recent movie that I shot, the reenactment. Uh, as of my last time I checked, it's still up on Tubi, um, the People Streaming Service. So uh, that's a it's a really fun one, and we had uh, you know got a lot of pride out of making it. So awesome, excellent! I did not realize that it was on Tubi, or I would have watched it by now. Yeah, it's it's saving you the twelve ninety nine or whatever it would be on uh, it was on iTunes. Fantastic! I love saving money. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, cool. Well, thank you so much for coming back again. And we will do our best to get on your show very soon. Mm -hmm. I'll send Don first, just in case you're wow. you know, eating people. But uh, that wasn't racist. I would send any of my friends. Now then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, nah, I, that's okay. Sincerely. Josh and I are going to plot, so it'll be fine. Fantastic. <laughs> now, I always love having you on the show. And, uh, you know, we didn't have any crazed uh, white men running around semis in this one so i'm a little disappointed but all right that was a forever purge joke check out you, that episode you win some you lose some we still need to I'm write still, that musical though i'm still talking about that dude anyway <laughs> uh so yeah so thanks for being here man uh, i guess that wraps it up so as always i am james sabata and i'm hungry so we'll see you next week here at the Necronomic.com, but it might just be Don's voice after he eats me.
Yeah, it'll just be the Necron. Nom, 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 nom. <laughs> 